Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Hazel Rick. She has a BS from Colorado State, an MS from Cornell, and a PhD from UVM. And she is the director of the Plant Diagnostics Clinic, which is a resource that probably many of us use as master gardeners. Um, also heavily involved in the integrated pest management piece at UVM. And um, oh, in the UVM Pesticide Education and Safety Program. So thank you, Anne. Um, I will turn it over to okay. you. Okay. And all right. Thanks. Well, this is a good crowd. Oh, hold on. One more thing. I'm sorry. I already forgot. Um, after this, after Anne's finished with her piece, uh, if the Guardian Club members can stay, we'll have this, a short business meeting. Thank you. Is that when we get the cookies? <laughs> well, hi. I'm so impressed with this turnout. Uh oh. Is that okay now? Okay. Does that help with the microphone? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, this is impressive. Another thing, another hat I wear is uh, I oversee the Master Gardener program at UVM. How many, do we have any Master Gardeners? Cool. Great. Thank you. Oh, Marie. She's a pro Master Gardener. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you guys are great. Thank you for being Master Gardeners. Um, so today I'm going to just talk about uh, challenges that we've seen uh, over the last year and maybe what's coming down the pike. Um, I always joke that it's uh, all this stuff, it's job security for me because there's, there's always something new and something <coughs> bad coming down the pike. Uh, this is a picture of my little barn, and that's my favorite plant, the wisteria up there. I love that plant. And there's a cultivar called Blue Moon that, I mean, I'm zoning 4B probably, and it flowers great every year. So I'm putting a plug in for wisteria. So, you know, the big news of last year, the past couple years, really is was spongy moth. And... Um, formerly known as Gypsy Moth, but now we're, uh, we've renamed it. But um, it's not an invasive. It's been here since 1880. Feeds on lots of different hardwoods, likes oaks and maples, but I saw it on my birch. I even saw it on um, conifers. So they'll just, they'll eat anything. Um, in 2021, almost 51,000 acres were defoliated in Vermont. But the good news is that last year, that number went down. So it was about 43,000 acres. And I'm hoping that's the trend. Um, so everybody's probably familiar with the uh, caterpillar, full grown. It's about two and a half inches long, has five pairs of blue dots, and then six pairs of red dots. And they eat like teenagers. <laughs> um, so they hatch in April to June, and I imagine, you know, we'll start seeing little caterpillars after this uh, warm week we're going to have. Uh, and they have several molts, so they get larger and larger uh, as the season goes on. But for each one of those masses, a thousand little caterpillars can come out of there. So if you're out walking around your land, if you see any of those now, scrape them off and try to get them destroyed because you've just gotten rid of a thousand little caterpillars. So um, they hatch uh, soon, and the best control is to use uh, an organic insecticide called uh, Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki. You want to have the kerstaki uh, name in there, but that's a great uh, targeted organic insecticide that only uh, gets Lepidoptera larvae. And so when they're small, that, you can control them very easily with that if you don't want to squish them all. The other thing you can do is uh, you could put up barrier bands right now before they hatch, only if uh, they're lower in the tree. The ones tall up in the tree, there's, you're not going to help with those. But if you put them up about four feet uh, up and you put a wrap plastic or something around the tree and then you put something gooey like Tanglefoot or Vaseline, um, that'll catch all the little caterpillars that are climbing up to the foliage. So that's another good organic thing you could do right now. I guess um, 
I did read one thing that said you should put chicken wire over that because birds could get caught in it if it's really thick. So just be aware of that. Uh, when the caterpillars are about an inch long, they crawl down during the day to hide. Um, so that's another time when you can put another kind of uh, like a burlap band around the tree. And you, you put the burlap on, you have a, a string tied around the tree, and then you f put a flap over it. And then they hide underneath those the two flaps. So you have to hand pick those um, and put them in. Uh, soapy water or something, but that's another good uh, organic way to manage it. But the good news is that the outbreaks won't kill a tree. It, usually, I always learned in grad school, it took like three years of defoliation to really kill a tree. So um, it won't kill a tree, but you might see more secondary problems. And if you have a young tree that you're trying to get established, I definitely would control them on young trees because you don't want those defoliated. Um, but you know it might make trees more prone to other problems so uh but if it's a big old tree you know that tree can withstand that kind of damage uh to some extent every year so they pupate in july they those ugly little pupil cases kind of orange hairy things um, and a week or two later the adults emerge and start laying eggs and the females just sort of sit there and just crank out eggs. Um, they don't move much. So the good news is, is that these uh, gypsy moth, um, spongy moth operate in like 10 to 15 year cycles. And they're usually held in check by fungi, a virus disease, and wasps, but not during drought. So I think that's what's happened is that we, we've had some uh, late summer droughts the past few years, um, seems like the faucet just turns off about July 1, and it gets hot and dry, and so I think that's why they've built up. But we must have had more rain, or we're t we typically have spring rain, so in 2022, I started seeing sick caterpillars. So if you see a caterpillar hanging in that V, that's, um, that's a caterpillar that's been killed by a virus. If you see a caterpillar that's hanging straight down, that's a fungal pathogen that's killed that. So those were on the rise. I saw a lot more of that last year. So I'm hoping that that's going to, you know, keep our populations down this year. The other thing, you know, that wasp that attacks the tomato hornworm that has those little white pupil cases, they also will attack um, spongy moths. So if you see a spongy moth with those little white pupil cases, leave those because they're going to. Uh, eat it up. So hopefully these are on all these virus and uh, fungi are on the increase. The other big pest that everybody talks about is this crazy snake worm, Asian jumping worm. It's about an inch to eight inches long. It was probably bought in, brought in 50 years ago in pots from Asia and it lives up in the upper leaf litter. Um, and it basically deprives plants of nutrients. It turns the soil into um, like coffee grounds. And that's how a lot of people figure out they've got jumping worms, is all of a sudden their soil looks like, like grainy coffee grounds, um, which doesn't hold water or nutrients very well, so that's why it's not good. Um, the skin is really glossy. The way you tell it has a light, smooth clitellum. That's that white band around it and it's, uh, I think it's not raised. I think the other one's raised. Um, but the easiest way to tell a jumping worm is it's really active. They just wriggle like snakes. Does anybody have them in there? Yeah. Oh, it's so depressing. I don't have them in my yard yet. But um, the other bad thing about this thing is it's parthenogenic. So uh, it needs no males to reproduce, so it can lay eggs and do everything all on its own. So, <clears throat> um, so if you've got one worm, you you might have a thousand the next year. Um, break up my clay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, maybe if you have clay, somebody was saying that you know maybe you guys don't have as many jumping worms because you have such clay soils here. So hopefully that's that's the case. 
they hatch in April, so this week they're hatching. It's over 50 degrees. So uh, they don't overwinter. The adult worms don't overwinter. They only overwinter as eggs. So this is what they do, is they feed on the upper leaf litter in forests. And if you look in a forest and you don't see a lot of up, uh, undergrowth, that could mean that jumping worms are there because they fed on all that leaf litter. And then here's the coffee grounds-like soil that they um, leave as their castings. And the castings are not fertilizing. No, no, I guess not. So the problem with these guys is that they lay these eggs called cocoons, and they're really persistent in summer droughts and low winter temperatures, and they can survive up to two years. And they're like two to four millimeters in size, and they're little brown things. So how are you ever going to find those in a pot or in, in your soil? So uh, that's the thing is we just, it's so hard to figure out how to pick out cocoons or kill the cocoons. So they can uh, be moved by your boots. So if you do have jumping worms and you know it's just in one area, really be careful not to move uh, the soil from that part of the garden to another part. They can move in pots uh, from nursery plants. Um, I think they're getting moved a lot by compost um, these days, and I'll tell you what you can do if you buy a, a compost. Also, fishing bait. When people buy uh, fishing bait, sometimes uh, Asian jumping worms or snake worms can be mixed in with the worms, and I guess when people fish, sometimes they just dump out the bait worms uh, when they're done, and so that's how they get into the uh, environment. So the key with this thing is just don't introduce it, because so far we don't have any way to control it. We're working on it, but we don't have any great, uh, great way to control it. Um, I know a lot of people are having plant sales. Uh, we wrote this little fact sheet about uh, what to do um, to minimize the uh, chance of spreading a uh, jumping worm if you're having plant sales. Um, you want to always check your pots. Don't bring anything in that uh, comes from a place with jumping worms. We're really suggesting that people try to do a lot more bare root stuff so you can wash the roots off and sell the plants that way. Um, but that's on the web uh, under the UVM Master Gardener website. And I wrote it with uh, uh, Joseph Goras, who's the person up at UVM doing a lot of the research. Yeah? If you had an earthworm and a jumping worm side by side, was it obvious? Yeah, it they is. really move like a snake. They're really active, whereas the earthworm will just slowly move away. Okay. But it's really, yeah. Ah. Yeah, and the earthworm has kind of a pink band. Um, and do the birds eat them or no? I think they probably do to some extent. But, you know, they can reproduce so quickly and so much that nothing really can keep up with it. So um, a lot of us like to buy compost. And so one thing we're suggesting is that uh, if you buy new compost, make sure you keep it away from your lawn and garden. You know, and buy it in smaller amounts. Don't buy it like three yards at a time. Buy maybe one yard because we could, you can solarize it. And that's a way to kill both the cocoons and the jumping worms. So if you buy the compost, you spread it out to like a six to eight inch depth. And you spread it out on top of a tarp. And then you put a painter's cloth, a clear plastic painter's cloth over it and seal it. And then if you have a couple days uh, in May or even April, as long as it gets above 105 degrees Fahrenheit, that will kill the cocoons and the worms. So if you leave that for a few days at that temperature, your compost should be safe. Um, also, if you buy compost in the bags, let those solarize too. Um, just make sure you don't you're not introducing would, yeah. you rec would you recommend that for if we buy moodoo stuff which is a very popular yeah here i would we would still get those bags what and just leave an intact bag on your on your lawn in the sun or something yeah right? or if you have a driveway maybe like a cement driveway or if i was going to put it on a lawn i guess i'd probably put a tarp under it just in case 
But yeah, definitely. Anything you get, you know, even if potting soil, I suppose it could come in on a plastic bag. It's easy enough to just let it sit out for a few days in the sun. And so I think it's a good, good practice. Um, Joseph Gores is finding that uh, if you do have infested soils um, and you're putting seedlings in, try to start with bigger seedlings and plant them maybe a little bit deeper so they can get past that sort of coffee grounds area. Um, because those castings just make for droughty soils and maybe higher salts. Um, so that's one of his suggestions. So yeah, like I said, currently there are no legal pesticide controls, so preventing invasion is key. Solarize everything. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, spread it out just so it's not any uh, deeper than the six to eight inches. Um, that's wrong, it's, it's 105 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. But um, the downsize is it might kill some of the beneficial organisms, microorganisms, but those will recolonate pretty quickly. So I wouldn't, I, it's better to try to kill the jumping worms. Um, yeah, like I said, compost in bags can be solarized in place. So Dr. Gores and his team at, work, at UVM are, um, they found a beneficial fungus that works with this uh, um, planting media, so they're looking into uh, that. They're also looking at uh, this product called tea tree seed meal. It's, um, it, that's shown promise. It's labeled, labeled for slugs in China, so he's going to be looking at that for this, um, for our area. Um, and like, uh, yeah, he's found this entomopathic fungi mixed with this uh, cocoa wet organic wetting agent. He's found 75% mortality of the worm. So he's really trying to figure out some good controls. He's also looking at solar, I mean, uh, steam sterilization, like in high tunnels. If they can sterilize those high tunnel soils, that might be a way to kill them. But it's, it's a problem that's here to stay. It's probably um, the map, uh, you know, it's been a real problem mainly in the east, but, you know, I think it's going to be everywhere eventually and it can survive all sorts of temperatures. Um, is there any benefit to covering a raised bed that seems to have the coffee granules with the clear You can try. Bed? You can try. Because, I mean, if, if some of it must be getting solarized just by being there. Yeah. I think if you put a plastic, clear plastic over a raised bed, that'll solarize that soil. Maybe you take it off, mix it up, and then re-solarize it again. So I think it's worth a try. Um, you can kill the adult worms, I think, by mustard or salt but, and vinegar, but um, that also messes around with your soil, and uh, it's not a, you can't kill the cocoon. So what he's really wanting to figure out is how to kill the young juvenile worms as soon as they hatch from the cocoons, because they'd probably be the most vulnerable then. So stand by, hopefully we'll we'll come up with something that's uh, good. Um, this is a problem that I've gotten a lot of calls about. Uh, end of the summer, it seems like we've been having a lot of early crab apple and apple tree defoliation. Has anybody noticed that in August? Yeah, there are no leaves on the crab apples. I to see when I called twice to say, is my crab apple tree dying? Yeah. <laughs> And they come, they'll come back. One way to check that, if, if it's dropped all your leaves, just take your thumbnail and scrape away the bark. And if it's still green, that's alive. And if you see bunny, I've done that. Yeah. yeah but it, it's pathetic looking come at the end of August. I know. It's been the past few years. And I think it's a, a bunch of different factors. I think apple scab, that fungus disease that starts out in the early spring. And lately, we've had wet early springs. Uh, so that really builds up that fungus disease. There's another um, fungal leaf spot that's causing problems. Cedar apple rust. We've had a lot more fire blight, and I'll show you pictures of that. That's another disease that's causing problems in apples and crab apples. And then spongy moth. That also likes crab apples. So I think all those things are contributing. Plus, when we have the droughty and hot summers, you know, that just stresses everything even more. So I think I think it's a whole combination of things. 
But luckily, they've all, you know, the trees have come back just fine. So apple scab is that fungus disease, the same with Mars, Marsanina leaf blotch, that's a newly diagnosed one, but it works just like apple scab. It overwinters on the fallen leaves, um, and then as soon as the green tips start coming out in the spring, those spores are ejected from those overwintering leaves onto the, the new leaves, and then every rain it reinfects. Um, so raking up the leaves in the fall is helpful, or mowing the leaves just to get them to decompose might help uh, lower that amount of disease. Cedar apple rust is another one that kind of uh, causes some defoliation. That's the cool fungus disease that um, one stage is on the cedar tree or juniper, and it has this, uh, these big orange gelatinous uh, galls with their spore horns and spores are liberated from those. Um, they, it looks like they're from outer space. They're amazing. Um, yeah, they are. Uh, usually you see them late May, early June when it's kind of warm and wet. Are they so, bad? We should knock them down when we do? Well, you should cut them and destroy them. Like now if you walk around and look at your junipers, they look like little brown galls, nutty galls on the tree, but those are all going to produce these big orange spore horns. So the spores from that stage are carried by wind currents over to the apple host, and then it causes that bright yellow leaf spot on the apple host. And then spores are liberated from that host, they go back to the juniper. So if you eliminated one of those two hosts, you've controlled the disease. So if I'm an apple grower, I don't want to have any junipers or cedars near my orchard because that just provides uh, the alternate host. Um, it's hard in neighborhood situations. You can't go cutting down your neighbor's uh, junipers the, and, uh, because the, the um, spores are carried, you know, probably five miles. You know, they're carried, they're really lightweight and they're carried on air currents. But I think all that's contributing to the, um, to the defoliation. Also, we're seeing much more fire blight and fire blight is a bacterial disease, and I used to think of it, it well, it used to be sort of a mid-Atlantic state problem. New York, Pennsylvania, uh, where it's warmer and wetter, but I think climate change in Vermont, you know, it's warmer and wetter up here. So we're seeing a lot more of this fire blight, and it can wipe out a young orchard. It's really devastating, and it's a, uh, it's a problem <coughs> because there, we don't have many, um, you can use antibiotics. So that's what the commercial growers can do, use streptomycin, but nobody wants to, I mean, we shouldn't be using antibiotics on our food crops. I mean, it's not good for us down the road, I don't think. <laughs> um, but as home gardeners, the symptoms are uh, when there's new succulent growth, all of a sudden it looks like it's hit by fire. And it just, a lot of times it curls over and you'll just see these dead branch tips. And that's pretty much probably fire blight. It attacks anything in the rosaceae family, so apples, pears are especially um, susceptible. Raspberries, mountain ash, ketoniaster, all those are in that same family. So fire blight can be a real problem. So if you do see this, uh, this is the disease that you can prune it out, but this is where you want to sterilize your shears between cuts. Um, because bacteria, unlike fungi, need a wound to get into a, a plant or a natural opening. So every time you're cutting, you're making a new wound and you don't want to introduce that bacteria. So surface sterilize with like alcohol or um, like a 10% bleach between cuts and do it only when it's dry. But pruning those out as soon as you see them is the best thing to do and just be vigilant, watch for new strikes. So uh, yeah, I think that's definitely contributing. We yeah, we've lost trees at, at the UVM orchard now from this disease. Um, yeah, like warm wet conditions, like only the succulent tissue. So that's why it's usually a problem in May and June. Has that shepherd's crooking. It can be moved by um, bees when they're working the flowers. So if it's warm and wet, um, when the when it's bloom time, the bees really can move this disease around. Um, like I said, just prune out because it can overwinter in the, um, in the dead branches. We lost a beautiful, huge bosque pear from this disease last year.
So the best thing you can do as home gardeners with any of these crab apple or apple diseases uh, is raking up the leaves in the fall or mowing them, anything you can do to get them to decompose. And then the other great thing is just really pruning the trees every year. Just you want to open them up to air and light because that's going to minimize all the diseases. Any of the most fungal diseases require six to eight hours of leaf wetness to infect. So if you can get that inside of the tree to dry off quickly by pruning out a lot of crossing branches and just opening it up, you'll have, uh, you know, it'll be less of a problem. <coughs> oh, I just throw these in because that's probably something we're seeing right now. You know, as the snow has receded, I don't know, the picture on the left is probably bunny rabbit <coughs> damage. Um, they especially like anything in the apple family, so always make sure you have hardware cloth wrapped. And they can really, you know, if the snow is two feet high, they can stand on top of that snow and eat above that. So you really have to have it, your hardware cloth up to the first branch to be safe. Uh, these are voles. I've got these everywhere. Voles uh, have the tunnels sort of in the ground, and the moles are the ones that pile up the soil on top of the ground. And moles, the way I, moles are meat eaters, M for meat eaters, voles are vegetarians. So voles are the ones that eat the plant roots and plants, but the moles are eating the grubs and earthworms and maybe your jumping worms too, so. <laughs> <laughs> They're better than the voles. So I was just gonna cover some of the greatest hits, something we see every year to some extent. On tomatoes, it's always early blight, septoria leaf spot. Uh, early blight has that sort of yellowing with a target shaped uh, spot. Septoria is a little black purple spot with a gray center. They both work the same way. They, you're, we're going to see them to some extent every year. They overwinter on dead tissue. Um, and then right around July 1st, the spores start splashing up to the lower leaves. So that's why these two diseases is why we stake tomatoes, why we use drip irrigation. We don't want to wet the leaves. In fact, our commercial growers, not many of them grow field tomatoes anymore. Everybody's inside high tunnels just to control these two, two diseases. Um, so they don't ever have to contend with rain. Their leaves never get wet when they use drip irrigation. Um, so that's why we stake drip irrigation, uh, Keeping up fertility will help too. If you let your tomatoes run out of gas, then they're, they can't withstand these diseases uh, as well. Um, I always, it'll start lowering the plant and work its way up. So by the time we get to September, your plant may be totally defoliated. It just kind of depends how much rain we have because every rain that it moves up higher in the plant. Um, yeah. I can't remember what else I was going to say. Uh, and we also, um, rotating will help with this disease, but all of us have pretty small gardens. We can't rotate three miles away to a new field. So, um, you know, the spores are probably carried by wind currents, but, um, you know, it does help with root diseases too. So it's always good to rotate plant families. Uh, so you want to rotate eggplant, pepper, and tomatoes in a group. Um, <clears throat> yeah, using a mulch, that's another good thing to do. If you use a mulch, um, even if the spores overwinter on the fallen tissue, it provides a barrier, so it may not make it through the mulch. Also, cleaning up our gardens in the fall, because it, it does overwinter on dead tomato tissue, so if you can clean all that up, till it under, get it to decompose, um, that will lessen the amount of disease. And you might notice, like cherry tomatoes don't really get this so much. Some cultivars might be more resistant than others. Um, so just keeping track of what cultivars work well. But I never control for this. Um, the best uh, organic uh, control would be doing all those cultural practices, and a last resort would be using something like a copper fungicide. Um. Someone at, uh, at a nursery once said, if you get early, early developing tomatoes, you can sort of out, out strip, you know, they, they'll, they'll start producing before the uh, early blight. So get some early developing 
Oh, oh that's a good, yeah. Tomatoes. Yeah, because I, I don't usually that. see it until the leaf spots start around the 1st of July. And by that time, you could already have some, some nice sized tomatoes if you get those early. Yeah, early that's rain. a, yeah, that's a good point. And I think that's a good point anyway, gr growing different cultivars to sort of stagger things. Um, is always a good uh, and cutting off the leaves when they well that's one them. thing you know I always get that question when I first see it can I cut off the leaves and control it that way you probably can't because you can't see all those places those spores are already have already landed and they're starting to infect you might slow it down a little bit but it, what it does help with if you prune those lower the lower leaves up to the first cluster that improves air circulation so they will dry off quicker, so it might help. But I wouldn't just drop it, you know, prune it and drop it right there. I would take it out of the garden. So yeah, copper spray um, would control this. You'd have to spray it every five to seven days. Um, and that's, you know, nobody wants blue tomatoes. But you could maybe pick a, uh, three weeks in the middle of the season sort of to buy you more time and then stop spraying. I don't know, I never bother with it. But uh, late blight is the other tomato disease that, uh, late blight, early, I don't know why they named them early blight, late blight, because late blight can show up before early blight. <laughs> it makes no difference. Um, but late blight is a really devastating disease pathogen because that's the one that caused the potato famine. Um, and it doesn't overwinter in Vermont. And luckily, for the past few years, it hasn't made it up here. So it does overwinter uh, down in the south, and there's a website you can look up called USA Blight to see where it is in the country right now. And as soon as it comes to Vermont, I start reporting into this that, yes, it's in Vermont. So you can see it sort of leapfrog its way up the coast, and it just depends on the, our storms. So if, we don't, if those storms don't bring the spores all the way up to Vermont, we don't have it. So that's been good. Uh, we had it really bad, and if anybody remembers, 2009, it came in uh, to the big box stores. All, all these tomatoes came in already infected with this. So we all put them out in our gardens, and then it was cool and rainy, and um, yeah, a lot of tomatoes were wiped out that year. It was really devastating. But fingers crossed we don't have that again. And I guess that's one good thing about these late summer droughts is that it doesn't, you know, bring the storms up from the coast as much. This is one that a lot of growers have been complaining more about, especially commercial growers that are in high tunnels. Um, because these guys, they're so <coughs> voracious. They really can eat a lot. And all the way, and they're so well camouflaged, the way you find them is your, um, your branches are just defoliated, or else you see the poop. That's the other thing. Um, tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm. So if you see one with the white pupae of the wasp, leave that because that's good. Uh, but what the commercial growers do in their high tunnels, they'll go out at night with a black light, and those little white stripes will light up, and that's how they find them, and then they just hand pick them. And all these commercial growers, they can just squish them. <laughs> they're too big. So I throw them. I throw them and I figure, okay, if they're strong enough to get back to my tomato plant, then then they deserve it. But and, <laughs> and, and yeah. um, these are actually yeah. a moth. Yeah. Neutral moth that is a pollinator. So what my friend taught me was she said, have have one tomato plant that's your sacrifice plant. Oh yeah. And so you just carefully take them off. And put them put on, on that one plant and let them do their thing and let yeah. them grow and then turn into this this nice pollinator moth. I, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, but it's a rather, I used to squish sense. them too, but I don't squish them anymore. Yeah, well that's yeah that's true. It's worth it's worth it just to and, and also I've had these these white little eggs also and I yeah. I learned that yeah you leave those yeah because they actually they're eating they're, they're, they're going to hatch and eat the insides out of the caterpillar. I think. <laughs> so this is a, a pest that I always get questions about because it kind of looks like a plant disease that those little angular leaf spots a lot of times on uh, basil mint shasta daisy but it's caused by a little uh, bug um, called the four-line plant bug 
and it just feeds in those little angular leaf spots. And you know, to control it, you'd have to spray all the time. It's not really um, worth it. So it's fine to eat damaged tissue like that. And if you're really, if you don't want your basal intact, you could put row covers over it or something like that. But that's one that people always think it's a disease, but it's actually a bug. And you, you rarely see the insect because it flies around a lot. Flea beetles, that's one of our first insect pests in the um, season, and they can really devastate little seedlings. So the best control on those guys is put your seedlings out later, let your seedlings get bigger so they can withstand it, and row covers. Row covers are the answer to everything. I think everybody should invest in whatever company that produces row covers, because we're going to end up covering everything, it seems like. Um, but that'll, if you uh, put your seedlings in and then immediately put the row cover on, um, that, and you rotate, you have to rotate, um, that will exclude those pests. And they just, yeah, they just can be devastating. Squash bug, that's another one that we see. Uh, these are creepy. They look too much like spiders to me. They, um, they're true bugs, which means they have a piercing, sucking mouth part and they just pierce the uh, tissue and then suck out plant juices. Um, and their legs look spidery to me. But uh, the easiest thing to do is to try to kill their egg masses. They're like root beer colored egg masses in the crotch angles on the leaf undersides. So if you see those, squish them. Um, yeah. Onion leek moth, that's one of those. Has anybody had this one? It's a fairly new pest, but I think uh, from the guys that are working on it at UVM, I think it's uh, decreased a little bit. So they're thinking that maybe there's a natural predator now that's um, controlling it somewhat. But right now, I just got an email. It's They're hatching right now. Uh, and. It's, uh, it has several generations, but this first generation will feed on leaves of anything in the onion or garlic leek uh, family. And it, they feed inside the leaves and cause this sort of window painting. So you can see this translucent uh, sort of window on the leaves. So if you pull that leaf apart, you'd see the little uh, caterpillar on the inside. Also, they love uh, the garlic scapes. So that might be the first place you see it. If your, if your garlic scapes have all that, if they look really tattered and things, uh, that's probably onion leek moth. So with this one, uh, row covers is another good one. If you're putting in onions, immediately put a row cover in. The second generation, the fall, really causes more damage because they can get into the bulbs. But they're pretty easy to uh, hand pick and squish. Um, but that's, that's a pretty new pest that we're seeing. And this is, uh, the pupae is really uh, easy to see. It's got a net over it. So if you see that, you want to squish that. And this is what the little caterpillar looks like. It's got an orange head and lots of spots on the body. Another pretty new pest uh, is called Swede Midge, and it only attacks um, brassicas. And they, some of the farmers at the Intervale uh, in, up in Burlington can't grow brassicas anymore because of this pest. It's a little midge, like a little fly, that lays an egg right in the growing point of brassicas. Um, and then it kills that growing point. And you'll either see multiple little heads or you know, bacteria and fungi just get in there. And it just you'll smell it before you see it. Um, so again, that's another one, row covers. You know, as soon as you put the plants out, if you've had that problem, make sure you cover them up. So you exclude that little uh, little fly. And it's small, and you never see it. But they are emerging now, uh, multiple generations per year. Uh, if you're a commercial grower, if you can rotate a mile away every three years, that's a way to control it. You want to always destroy the old crops. Yeah. Use row covers and weekly applications of kale and clay, which is a really good organic. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. That's just a clay that you spray on plants, and it's an anti feeding It turns the plants white, but by the time you're ready to harvest something, it's washed off. 
Um, the other controls are uh, two organic ones are neem and spinosin. But row covers are an easy way to way to go. Um, spotted wings are softer. This came in on Hurricane Irene. When when was that? I uh, 11, 11, 11, 14? 11. 11. 11. 11. Okay. Um, this was uh, in Asia. It made it to Hawaii, then it made it to the U.S., and it's just leapfrogged its way over to the East Coast, and then Hurricane Irene brought it up to Vermont. It is just the worst new pest for small fruit growers. Um, so it's a little fly, a fruit fly, and usually fruit flies are no problem. They just sort of attack rotting things or broken split fruit. You know, it tells us we need to clean up our kitchen a little better if we, uh, if we have fruit flies. But this fruit fly actually cuts into intact fruit. So as soon as the fruit is starting to ripen, this fruit fly is attracted to those smells. It uses this little sawtooth ovipositor to lay an egg in the fruit. And then if you, um, these were a bunch of raspberries that were picked, left out on a counter, and those are all the larvae uh, that came out of that. Um, yeah, it's so it's so depressing. If you're a conventional small fruit grower, you can control it pretty easily with conventional insecticides. But if you're an organic farmer, it's really tough because there are two different organic uh, sprays you can use, and one and you need to rotate them so they don't build up resistance. And one works really well, and the other one doesn't. So you sort of get one week of control, and then one week of buildup, one week of control. Um, but the good news for us is, as home gardeners, you know, we don't have typically two acres of small fruit, um, but we have a patch in row covers. There's a special row cover that you can get that'll last for several years if you take care of it. Um, you can get it from uh, Brookdale Farm Supplies, uh, maybe Agway or, or Gardener Supply. It has to be a certain, it's called Protec 80. It's got a very small hole so that the fly can't get in. So as soon as your fruit is getting ready to ripen, you need to have those row covers on. Um, and then they have to be sealed at the base. And then it's a hassle because you have to open it up to go in and pick your fruit and then put it right back down. So the other thing you can do, use row covers, refrigerate your fruit as soon as it's picked because if there's larvae in there, that'll slow them down. You don't tell your husband about it. <laughs> I made, uh, I always like to make raspberry sorbet, and so I just don't even tell him about this pest. Um, it's okay to eat them. It's just, it's just protein. But, uh, but I'm a vegetarian, so I don't want to eat them. Uh, yeah, and pick up anything that's dropped. But uh, usually they're not a problem early in the season, like strawberry, strawberries, they haven't built up enough, but by the time you're go you've got fall raspberries or late blueberries, they're really a problem. And they'll attack any soft fruit, so like honeysuckles, um, cherries, uh, but they love fall raspberries and blueberries. But this has been sort of a deal breaker for our small fruit growers, especially our um, organic small fruit growers. And I think our big small fruit, Adams Berry Farm up in Burlington, I think he grows a lot of his stuff in high tunnels now just to, because of this pest. So if you don't think you have this, I've talked to a lot of people that um, you know, their blueberries are ready to ripe and then all of a sudden they just sort of melt away really fast. That's typically because they're infested and other things have moved in to rot them. But if you don't, if you want to test to see if your small fruit have this pest, you can get a, a little bowl of water, salted water, and then put the, mash the berries in there, and within a couple hours, if, if the larvae's there, they'll come out, and you'll see them. Um, so you can test your own fruit. Cucumber beetle, another really uh, bad pest early season that if you put your seedlings out really small, uh, they can just decimate them. So that's another one. Grow bigger seedlings, hold on to them a little bit, give them a jump start before you put them out. And this is one where the commercial growers, they can make up these slurries of kale and clay. It's called Surround is the brand name. 
but they make up a slurry and they just take their flats of cucumbers and dip them in this slurry. Um, this is a pest that is really depressing to me. I've had this in my, they must, I must have a big enough population now. It's called squash vine borer and there's only one generation of this per year. It's got a, it's a big, pretty clear wing moth, so you might see it flying around. But they lay eggs at the base of any squash plant, and then what you see is the plant is wilting, and then you look at the blade, base of the plant, and you see lots of frass, and it's rotting. And if you open it up, there's this huge larvae in there. It's so, it's huge. Um, yeah, and then they, uh, they've wiped out all my squash every year. So I haven't figured out how to control it. I've heard you can put, um, like, uh, somebody said tin foil around the base of the plant to discourage egg laying. You could spray organic insecticides, but you kind of have to spray all the time. Some of the commercial growers let, um, they use row covers and they sort of miss the first fruit because they just, they still have row covers on when the plants are fat flowering, but they feel like that helps them miss a lot of this um, damage and then they take the row covers off and then they get the next flowers. Um, so that's an option. But it's, yeah, it's so depressing when you've got these big beautiful squash plants. Even zucchini. I haven't been able to grow zucchini. Don't just notify somebody who does I know, that's true. <laughs> I know, it's true. Uh, Colorado potato beetle, that's always going to be around. Hand pick, kill eggs. You can use neem or spinosad. Uh, those are two organic insecticides. But the plants can take, I think, 30% defoliation before it really affects the crop. So you can, it can uh, take a few, uh, a few beetles. These are a couple problems I've seen in the last week. And this one on the left is in my garden. I don't know how it got there, but it's Star of Bethlehem. Does anybody know that? It just is so invasive. It's just showing up everywhere. Um, and it's kind of pretty, but I don't know that I want it in my garden. And this was another one, liverwort. It's kind of a, um, sort of like a moss. Uh, it's really a problem in greenhouse soils, but it can be a problem in any soil that's kind of wet and shaded. And they're tough to get rid of. I think you can use vinegar, um, but that's one I've gotten some calls about. This is another one that the uh, that's called blueberry stem gall wasp. Somebody called about that last week. It's kind of a woody gall on the blueberry. Uh, another one that we just got a uh, question about is this creeping butternut that's gotten into somebody's garden and it reproduces, spreads by stolen. So uh, you just basically have to dig it up. Another one, uh, the pest on the left, snow midge. Uh, they were noticing all these insects like on their screen door. And it's just, they just, it was an early hatch. It doesn't hurt anything. It's just, um, uh, doesn't hurt plants or the home. Same thing with a stonefly. Somebody sent in a picture of a larvae of a stonefly. They're just sort of aquatic. That's an aquatic insect. But it doesn't hurt anything. Okay, what to expect in 2023? Boy, we've had some, last year we had amazing sunsets, at least for my house. And the other few nights ago, there was another amazing sunset. Yeah, I don't know what, if it's wildfires or what's, what's causing it. So, hammerhead worms, has anybody heard of that? Yeah, it's a flat, it's a flat worm, which is different from an earthworm. It's like a tapeworm, kind of. I think it's in that family. But it doesn't cause problems in us. But it's a new invasive flatworm. It likes tropical climates, but it could be a problem in greenhouses and high tunnels. And I showed this picture at the flower show, and a guy came up afterwards and said, yeah, I've, got, I've seen that in my garden. And I talked to Joseph Gores, and he said, yeah, I found a bunch of them at the Hort Farm. So it's a flatworm with like a, sh a hammerhead, like a double, like, yeah, they're weird looking, I guess. I've never seen one. But they're a predator of earthworms, so they may help us with the jumping worms. We don't know. I was asking him about that, and he said, well, jumping worms usually move so fast for this guy that they get away. So, but they'll get earthworm slugs. Um, but this worm, don't pick it up because it secretes toxic chemicals through its skin. 
to make itself noxious to predators and it can cause skin irritation in us. So I'd be interested in you, if you see one. So they're definitely here in Vermont. This is something we'll probably see in the next few weeks. Almost always, you know, once our asparagus starts coming up, we get a frost, uh, and that's what, and it's crooks over the um, asparagus. Also, when our strawberries are blooming, if we get really cold temperatures, if you see the black center, that means it's a frosted uh, strawberry and it won't reproduce. So we're not, I mean, we're having 70 degrees today, but it's, you know, we're, we're still going to be cold. This is a new pest that's sort of coming up from the Hudson River Valley, and it's not in Vermont yet, but we assume it's going to come. It's another allium pest. Uh, it overwinters as a pupae, and then it hatches, it's hatching now, and the female lays eggs in the allium, and it causes those little polka dots all up and down the stem. So that's how you know you've got that pest. Also, it causes curling and twisting of the foliage. So if you see this, these symptoms, we'd like to, we'd love to know about it. But it's caused millions of dollars of losses in New York. They grow a lot of onions. and. Uh, you know, they're sort of, they're leaf miners, so they feed in between the two leaf surfaces, and it just opens up the plant for lots of fungi and bacteria, and so they rot. So I think that's what the big losses are about. And it's a little maggot, so it's not a caterpillar like the other one. It's a maggot, so it looks like a, it's a fly larvae. So this is something coming down the pipe. This is another one that I didn't think was going to be a problem here. Uh, has anybody been to Maine and heard of brown-tailed moth? It's a real problem in, in coastal Maine, um, but I guess it's spreading west, and I was reading some literature that said it was here in 1917, but maybe it was too cold and it died out. But it's a little uh, moth, white moth and a caterpillar, and the reason it's so bad is that it um, it has urticating hairs, so if you touch it, some people, if they breathe the hairs, can cause like allergy symptoms, but it um, it's almost lo looks like that cow parsnip stuff, you know, you get sort of raised blisters, but it's a real problem on the coast, so um, something that might be coming our way. <clears throat> this is a new pest that... Um, is just a matter of time. It's uh, yeah. called the spotted lantern fly, and it, again, it was from Asia. Um, and it's not a moth or a butterfly. It's a plant hopper, so it has sucking, piercing, sucking mouth parts. But it's beautiful. And I guess we've had some came up on a truck, and they caught, they were dead, and we they found them in Vermont. But they're great hitchhikers, so they probably are going to be here. And we'd love to know if you see these. Um, but they're beautiful, all these polka dots. This is the picture on the um, left is where they are now, but the potential uh, distribution of the spotted lanternfly goes all the way up Lake Champlain. So I imagine we're going we're gonna to have these. They're going to overwinter here. Um, and this is why they're a problem. They feed in mass, and they suck plant juices, so they just uh, reduce the vigor of plants. And the two, those are the uh, larval stage, the nymph stage, and those feed also. And those are, they're beautiful bugs, you know, white polka dots on red or black. But yeah, they really um, feed gregariously. They feed on over 65, 70 species of plants. We're really worried about them. Uh, apples, grapes uh, are the, probably two main food crops, especially grapes. Um, but they'll also attack silver red maple hops, sumacs. Um, both the nymphs and adults suck plant juice and can cause city, sooty mold. So when these sucking, uh, when they suck plant juices, they excrete the sugars, and then uh, a black fungus grows on those sugars. And that's sometimes how you know you've got the pest is that sooty mold. But they prefer um, Alanthus and black walnut. And Alanthus is tree of heaven. I've never seen that, but I guess we do have it in Vermont, so we're trying to identify um, where Tree of Heaven is so we can really watch them as trap, trap crops. So, like I said, they lay eggs everywhere, and that's how they're going to be brought up here is probably as hitchhikers on tires. 
So that egg mass on the right, that's the spongy moth. It's kind of buff colored, but the egg mass on the left, it looks like just cement, like gray cement. That's the lantern fly um, egg mass. So uh, hopefully we can nip it in the bud, I'm not sure, but uh, that's something we're really watching for. Beach leaf disease, that's another new disease. I feel like everything is just under attack. Um, it was found in 2012, uh, but it's moving its way up uh, into New England. And I was just down in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and, and the pathologist down there said, yes, yeah, it's, it's in all of our beech trees. And the symptom it causes, causes that uh, banding on the foliage, like dark green band, light green band. Um, and it can kill trees within six to eight, eight years. Um, and 25% of our forests in Vermont are beach. So uh, this is going to be a huge problem. The easiest time to see it is in the spring. So if you guys are looking at any beech trees this spring, let me know if you see any of that alternate banding in the, in the new leaves. Also, it can cause curling and distortion of the new leaves. Um, causes the thinning of the canopy, attacks any beach, either forest or landscape beaches, um, and death in six to 10 years for mature trees. <coughs> so sometimes you can notice, you know, the canopy thins out, but this banding is really distinctive. And um, it's caused by a foliar nematode, which uh, a nematode is a little microscopic worm, and they infest, um, they attack hostas. We have foliar nematodes in hostas, and typical, that's what it looks like on a hosta, but typically with foliar nematodes, they can't cross leaf veins, so that's why you see that banding. They can't cross the veins, so that's typical for any foliar nematode. Um, they're trying to figure out what, how, why is it moved so fast, um, and they think maybe birds are spreading it. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of people working on it. It's, there's no control at this point. So something to watch for. Another new disease that we don't have yet, but it's in the, um, they found it near Albany, is oak wilt. It only attacks red oaks, but um, it's a fungus that blocks the flow of water and nutrients from the roots to the crown. So this is where it is so far. Only attacks red oaks. Uh, pin oak, black oak, scarlet oak, those are all red oaks, and they can die within a matter of a few weeks to six months. And it spreads quickly. Um, <clears throat> so this is one we're watching for. The, um, the symptoms are you'll see a wilt of the uh, tree, but also um, it's spread by beetles carrying the fungus. And you'll see these, they're called spore pads on the outside of the tree, and that's, um, it's called an infection pad where the spores are produced and it has a sweet odor. Um, the main control is don't prune oaks from April to July to prevent spread by insects. And it can spread by root grafts. So they're trying to go along and, and sever all the root grafts of uh, oak trees, like in parks and things like that. And don't move firewood from oak wilt infected areas. You can use fungicides on high value trees, but hopefully uh, it won't show up here. Um, so basically, that's, that's kind of what's coming down the pike. If you guys have any questions on pests or diseases, I'm always happy to uh, answer emails. My email was on the first slide. Uh, it's just ann with no e dot hazelrig at uvm.edu. A lot of pe times people take pictures <coughs> or something and they can email it to me. and. Um, it's been great. All the commercial growers have smartphones now, so sometimes I can get in, get them an answer, you know, within five minutes of a of a picture that they send. The other option is a uh, better option probably is to use the Ask Extension. Go through the UVM Master Gardener uh, website, and there's a portal called Ask Extension, and you can write in your question. You can post pictures. And then one of the uh, helpline volunteers will uh, answer the question. And they do the research on the um, problem. And a lot of times, if it's a disease or insect things, I, they add me as a collaborator so I can uh, help them on the diagnosis. But um, that's another great way to get questions answered. So I think, yeah, I think that was it. 
So I'm happy to take any questions or if I've overwhelmed everybody. Maybe. <laughs> I would like to get back to growing lilies. Yes. How do you keep from getting red lily beetles, or what do you do with them? Well, they're supposedly, uh, they've tried to introduce a, a parasite, and it's, they were develop, developing it out of Rhode Island. And I think it's caught on some places. I need to see if I can get some of it. Um, so some of the populations have gone down in number, uh, but if you still have them, basically using neem as soon as you find them, that's the good organic control. And the larvae of those are so ugly because they um, poop on their backs so that the birds don't eat them. So they look like <laughs> slugs and they're just gross. But yeah, neem as soon as, so you need to um, sort of scout your lilies on a regular basis. In the past, I used pyrethrin. Is that Pyrethrin? a no-no? Is that a no-no now? Well, I don't know. I've heard neem works well, so I guess I would just go to go to neem if that's mm -hmm. what, as a direct Yeah. Thank you. Yeah? I think this is a very dumb question, but years ago, I gave up on row covers because I had to undo the bottom to make sure the seedlings had enough water. Yeah. And when we talk about you have to seal the edges, how are you supposed to do that? I know, it's, they're such a hassle. A lot of the commercial growers get those like sand tubes. Oh, okay. You know, something like that. You could maybe uh, use, you know, like a long two by four to weight it down or something. Yeah. Soil and rocks. Yeah, soil I'll rocks. I'll do that, but it, 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 there are always gaps. Yeah, I know, it's really tough. Yeah, and it's tough because you have to take them off to pick or what, and to water, and, unless you've got drip irrigation. Somebody else had a hand up somewhere. Oh. Um, yeah, so if you see any of those new and interesting things, we'd love to uh, know about it. But, um, yeah. Oh. Can I just add, um, yeah. when you were talking about the spongy moth caterpillars, um, and you had said if you see those, um, egg sacs on the trees, yeah. you said just scrape them off. But you, what I want to add, because I've dealt with them now for a while, is don't just scrape them yeah, off right. to the ground, because that won't do a thing. Yeah. So if you are going to scrape them off, scrape them into soapy water right. that you leave for a couple of days. Yeah. Don't just go around scraping them off. Right, the exactly. Ground. Exactly. Yeah. Um, in New Jersey, for the spotted lanternfly, yeah. they would take a bag and put hand sanitizer in it and scrape Oh, really? Um, and the egg masses in there? That. So maybe that would work as well. Mm. And then just like squish it. Yeah, because I guess there's alcohol the in there, right? Yeah. 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 Last year we had on our plum tree, the leaves, a whole bunch of little white, a whole bunch, a lot, a lot of little white bugs. Um, do you have any, I, I, I don't really know how to describe them, I guess. Is that something that's common that you might no, it's not something, it was it earlier in the spring, early in the season? Yeah, I think they, they hung out for a while. We tried spraying it with soapy water. You know, yeah, water. I mean, probably an aphid of some mm -hmm. sort. You know, they like new succulent tissue. Yeah. And usually when the plant hardens off a little bit after the spring, you know, in the summer, they don't, they're not a problem anymore. Um, but yeah, insecticidal soap or they don't cause that much problem not really and the other thing is I think we had brown rot too but I so maybe more pruning so that the sun can get in I guess yeah yeah brown rot is a real problem brown rot is kind of it's a fungus disease on stone fruits and it's sort of it's sort of acts a little bit like fire blight on stone fruits um, so if you have brown rot um, you want to pick off all the mummies on your tree and you don't want to leave any overwintering fruit you can spray a fungicide. I think you can spray sulfur in the fall to control it. But yeah, opening up the um, plant to air and light will help. I think the other problem we had is we blew mulch with leaves on the ground everywhere. And I think we got to get all those leaves out. Yeah, typically over winters on the mummified fruit, not so much on the leaves. But yeah. Is black and brown bug the same? Is what? Black, black. bug and brown bug the same. 
black rot and brown rot? No. Uh, yeah, plant pathologists, they come up with the worst names. So black knot <laughs> is also a disease of stone fruits, and it's a fungus disease also, but it gets sort of, um, causes those black knotty galls. Yeah, you have a really bad, I, but you still, I always say that you had that really bad plum tree, but you still have lots of fruit. Do you still have lots of fruit, or is it dead now? No, I haven't had fruit for oh. close to 10 years. Okay. I just hang a bunch of good feeders on it. Oh, okay. I have it on the uh, black cherries in the, in the boot. Yeah, so that's how so I, I identify black cherries, is if they have those black, knotty galls. So and so spores are... Uh, but does the, the brown one look like that? Brown rot uh, on the fruit, when it's getting ripe, it'll have all this brown, like powdery, sugary spores on it. I know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Black knot, you can try to prune out those galls, but those are the black ones are usually the old ones. The new ones sort of just like a, look like a swelling on the branches, so they're really hard to find. But if you're going to plant a new plum, look for something that's black knot resistant. So there are some out there because any kind of plum will get it otherwise. I have a question. Do you have a favorite uh, way to deal with Japanese beetles? Uh, there is no really good, easy <laughs> control for those. There's, and organic stuff is not very good either. Pyganic, I've heard, uh, which is kind of a pyrethrum thing. But um, yeah, you know, I let, I let them eat, I guess. It depends what plant it's on. Is it on everything, or sure. if it's on yeah. raspberries? I mean, you can use like a netted row cover, but oh, it, I'm, I'm, I don't do vegetables as much as I do flowers, and they love everything. Yeah, they, yeah, I know. Go around and pick yeah. them into a, a, you know, I hit them off into a right a bucket of soapy water, but yeah, that, that you know that uh, a lot of people. I think in the garden stores they sell milky spore disease, but that's the entomologist that used to be our state entomologist always said, no, it's not warm enough here for that to become established in our soil, so that's not worth it. I've heard there are some beneficial nematodes, but I don't know. They fly in from so many places. I don't know. Yeah, there's no good easy control. And, and I, ha I have a, a, a oh, something good. weird that happened in my garden last year. I planted three new elderberries, yeah. and in one of those, there was a little volunteer tomato plant that came up. It must be from the, the, the uh, compost. There were no Japanese beetles on that one, and the other two were covered. So I'm going to plant some little tomato plants. Well, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's worth a try. I, I'm just going to try. Yeah. Yeah, they're so discouraging. They don't usually show up till. Around right, 4th of July, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, was and then they're yeah. yeah. I know. We make this thing where we take two two-gallon milk jugs and put the, the tops together, so one's upside down on top of the yeah. other one, and my husband puts a little little short piece of like garden hose and clamps it on and then cuts off the top of the top one. And then when you, when you brush the milk, the oh, they can't get off. back out. It happens like a funnel. It goes through and they can't get out. And they all, they rot in there and it smells terrible. Yeah. But I think actually the rotting stuff oh my, discourages. It discourages the other ones too. So <laughs> every morning I go out to the grapes and the apples and the roses and everything. I put all these, you know, you can fill up. You can fill up. With yeah. Them, but it works pretty well. He should market that. You could be rich. <laughs> <laughs> all right. One more question? Yep. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Somewhere along the line, I heard that you should crush aspirin and put that in a spray bottle and spray your tomatoes early to prevent some of the diseases. <coughs> well, <laughs> never heard of that, but you know, as a pesticide education person, I can't. You can't recommend any pesticides that are not that don't have a label for that. Mm -hmm. So that would be a, an off-label use. So I can't say. Or you know, like the baking soda sprays. And you know, those, sprays. yeah, mm -hmm. baking soda sprays work. That's a great fungicide. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, a chemical company was smart enough to notice that it really worked, so they created a fungicide called Armacarb that <laughs> costs a whole lot more than baking soda. <laughs> but now they you can spray it. But baking soda and water makes a good spray? For your tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> it's only for things with powdery mildew. 
And yeah, no, tomatoes don't really have problems with powdered milk. But I've never heard that about, you know, with some of this anecdotal stuff, you know, the problem is, is they, you know, nobody ever does replicated trials. So if you want to do some of that anecdotal stuff, try it on one tomato, leave the other one untreated, and really see if there's a difference. All right. One last, last question. <laughs> are we being overrun with insects, or have they always been there since micro microscopes were invented? Yeah, I don't know. You know, you read all those things that how our insect numbers are down, and I do, I mean, I do remember as a kid, your windshield was yeah. like filled yeah. with bugs yeah. and a grill, yeah. and now it never, you never have bugs. But we've got a whole lot of, I think we have a whole lot more pests that I don't know if, um, yeah. Could be, yeah, could be these. Controlling the, right, exactly, yeah. Well, anyway, thank you for coming. <coughs> this was great. <laughs>